This film is presented by the Films for Christ Association, an interdenominational, nonprofit ministry devoted to the production of Christ centered media materials that share and defend biblical truths. People are confused about the creation evolution controversy. Is this issue really important to Christianity? Or is it just a side issue? Can it really affect the average family? Mr. Ken Ham, an author and native Australian, has had years of personal experience in Christian ministry and public education. He has a unique grasp of the true importance of the book of Genesis and especially the foundational issue of creation versus evolution. Mr. Ham is a staff member of the Institute for Creation Research in San Diego, California. He has spoken at hundreds of churches, schools, and colleges internationally. You know, this topic of creation evolution really is an important topic. Many people think it's just, well, it's a side issue. After all, who's really interested in carbon-14, rubidium, strontium, ontogeny, and phylogeny, and all that sort of stuff? Who's really interested in technical details of creation, evolution? Surely the more important thing to do is to fight issues in society like abortion, pornography, homosexuality, all sorts of things. And so many people think that creation evolution is just another issue like many others. One of the things I believe we need to understand is that the creation evolution issue really is foundational to all of these issues. And if we really want to understand what's happening in relation to things like abortion, pornography, homosexuality and so on, we must understand what's happening at the level of creation and evolution. Now, in leading into all of this, the first thing we need to understand is a little bit about creation, a little bit about evolution, so that we start to grasp what the whole battle is. Because many people think the battle is just religion versus science. Creation's religion, evolution's science. Evolution, well, you see we have uh, unbiased scientists who have obviously shown that evolution's true. 
Now, I'd like to talk a little bit about that to start with. Scientists, well, you see, I believe there are four commonly believed facts about the scientist. One is, most people believe they're unbiased, or they're objective, or they're infallible, or they always wear a white lab coat. Now, I'd like to say to you that an example of a real scientist is the fact that he is biased, he's not objective, he's human, so he's not infallible, and he doesn't always wear a white lab coat. In fact, I've found that scientists come in two basic forms, male and female, and they're just like you and me. And they have beliefs and biases that determine what they do with the evidence. For instance, have a think about a scientist who's an atheist. You know, Isaac Asimov professes, I believe, to be an atheist. A scientist who's an atheist says no God exists. Do you realise whenever he looks at evidence, he can never allow the question or the option, did God create, could the Bible be true, could Noah's flood be true, because as soon as he allows those as options, what's he stop being? An atheist. An atheist is 100% biased. Even if he found a big boat on the top of Mount Ararat, it can have nothing to do with Noah's flood, it has to be a, a Russian plot or something like that, because you see, he's an atheist. In other words, a scientist who's an atheist has already ruled out that the evidence can have anything to do with the Bible. What about a person like myself, a revelationist? I believe the God of history has revealed in his word, the Bible, the truth about history. Can I ever consider the question, did God not create? When I look at evidence, the answer is no, because I know he did, I know that's truth. No matter what evidence I find, it will fit that framework, and it does. You see, in reality, it's not a matter of whether you're biased or not, but which bias is the best bias to be biased with anyway. <laughs> and you know, the bias you have will determine what you do with the evidence when you find it. For instance, the evolutionists have a particular belief, and that's all it is. Evolution's not science, because science can only deal with what you have in the present. It's a belief about the past, which they use to try and explain the facts which only exist in the present. And when you think about it, there was no observer there. They don't have a written record. They don't have a witness from the past. They have people who don't know everything, who have said, this is how we explain the evidence of the present. On the other hand, as a Christian, I have a book which claims to be the revealed Word of God. It says God was there, God was a witness from the past, that he's recorded for us all we need to know, and it tells us that the book of Genesis is an accurate account of the origin and history of life, so that as a scientist, if I do have a witness who is there who knows everything, I can go back and see what it says and go out and look the evidence and see if the evidence fits with what it says about the past. And it does, overwhelmingly so. The evidence to fit with Noah's flood is all there in the fossils. You see, in reality, it's not religion versus science, it's really the science of one religion versus the science of another religion. For those of us who are Christians, creation is a belief, it's a religious belief, but it's based on revelation from someone who was there. And we can go out and test it. Of course, evolution is a religion, but it's a religion without revelation. One of the things I want to say right now and emphasize to you is that evolution is religion. It is not science. If you understand what science is at all, you would start to understand that it has to do with what you can deal with in the present, what you can observe, what you can repeatably test. Evolution is a belief. It's a religion. In fact, the Webster's Dictionary defines religion as a concept, a principle, a system of belief held to with ardor and faith. And that's exactly what evolution is. Okay, understanding that evolution is religion, that creation is religion too, what does it really matter? How do these different religious beliefs affect us? And that's one of the things that we're going to look at in detail. First of all, let me read to you from the Bible, from the revealed Word of God. We read the words of Jesus Christ, who is the creator of the world. And there he says this, Do not think that I'll accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuseth you, even Moses, in whom ye trust. For had you believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if you don't believe his writings, how shall you believe my words? If you believe not his writings, how shall you believe my words? That's an interesting statement by Jesus, isn't it? If you don't believe the writings of Moses, how can you believe what I'm saying, he's telling us. You know, we find a similar statement in, say, Luke 16. The rich man who died and went to a place of torment, Lazarus who went to be with Abraham, and the rich man wanted to go back and warn his brothers about this horrible place. And he wasn't allowed to. And he said, well, let Lazarus go back. Let someone be raised from the dead, because then they'll obviously believe. They'll repent. Abraham said unto him, they've got Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. Nay, Father Abraham, if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And what did Abraham say? He said unto him, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, even if one rose from the dead. 
You know, there are many references to the writings of Moses right through the New and Old Testament. In fact, there are more references to one book in the writings of Moses than any other in the entire Bible. Have a guess which book that is. Genesis. Isn't it interesting that Genesis is the most quoted from or referred to book in the entire Bible, and yet in Christian and non-Christian circles alike, it's one of the most scoffed at, mocked at, ridiculed, disbelieved, thrown out, stood on, allegorized, mythologized, ripped apart, or whatever. It takes you three days in front of a mirror to practice that, believe me. In other words, the book that is the most quoted from or referred to is the most attacked. Why? Psalm 11, verse 3, the psalmist tells us this. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? What does that mean, if the foundations be destroyed? If you try to build a house, how do you do it? Well, watch the builders in Australia or America, and you notice they always start with the roof, then they start with the ceiling, then they uh, go to the walls. Is that what they do? Of course not. We start from the foundations up because we know we need the foundation for the structure to stand. If you pull the foundation away from a structure, what happens? the structure collapses, doesn't it? If you pull the foundation away, the structure collapses. I want us to think very carefully about this whole issue of creation because we need to grasp hold of the fact that Genesis is like a foundation and the rest of the Bible is like a structure. Why? You see, all biblical doctrines of theology ultimately have their basis, directly or indirectly, in the book of Genesis. And there's a concept that we all need to really grasp and understand. The meaning of anything is tied up with its origin. You see, the meaning of marriage is tied up with its origin, which goes back to Genesis. The meaning of sin is tied up with its origin, which goes back to Genesis. The meaning of death is tied up with its origin, which goes back to Genesis. The meaning of the seven-day week is tied up with its origin, which goes back to Genesis. And so it goes on. Why Jesus died on a cross is because of what happened back there in Genesis, the events of the book of Genesis. All biblical doctrines ultimately have their basis in the book of Genesis. And so what I'm saying to you is this. If you take away a foundation, if the foundations are destroyed, what will happen to the structure? It will collapse. If you wanted to attack Christianity and you wanted to destroy Christianity in the nations of the world, one of the best ways to do it is to attack the foundations because once you remove the foundations, the structure collapses. I believe one way in which this is happening is the very attack on the book of Genesis by the evolutionary philosophy which says you can't trust Genesis. Evolution has proven that the Bible's wrong. And I believe it is one of the most vehement attacks on Christianity today. What's the real difference between creation and evolution, first of all? Well, let's look at it this way. There was a student at one particular school who came to me and he said, Hey, sir, why can't I write my own rules about life? You want to write your own rules about life? Yes, sir. All right, you do that, son, and I'll tell you what. I'll shoot you. <laughs> you can't do that, sir. Why not? It's not right. Why isn't it right? Well, it's wrong. Why is it wrong? Well, it's not right. <laughs> I said, well, you've got a problem, haven't you? You want to write your own rules about life? Yes. Well, can I write my own rules about life? Sure, sir, everyone can write their own rules. All right, well, one of my rules is going to be types like you are dangerous. If I find enough to agree with me, we're going to eliminate you from society. You can't do that, sir. Why not? It's not right. Why isn't it right? It's wrong. Why is it wrong? It's not right. He had a problem, didn't he? You know what his problem was? He was an evolutionist. He didn't believe in creation. But he said, I'm a product of chance. Nobody made me. I can write my own rules. Why not? But then he could have his opinion. Someone could have their opinion. Somebody else could have their opinion. Everyone could have whatever opinion they wanted to. You know, if you believe in creation, what does that mean? Doesn't it mean there's a creator? The creator owns you. He sets the rules. It means we are to be in total submission to him. He is the absolute authority. He sets what's right and what's wrong. He has a right to do that because he owns us, because he created us. On the other hand, if you believe you're a product of chance random processes, who owns you? You do. Who sets the rules? You do. Who decides what's right and what's wrong? You do. You know, in the book of Judges, it says concerning the Israelites, when they had no king, no absolute authority, no one to set the rules, no one to set the law, no one to tell them what was right and what was wrong, everyone did what was according to his own eyes, his own opinion. I'd like to suggest to you this. The more that people reject creation, the more they reject the basis that God is the absolute authority, the more they reject there is a law giver, and of course, doesn't Paul tell us God gave the law so we'd understand what sin is all about? If you remove the law, then what's sin? 
There's no such thing as sin. And the more people reject that basis in the absolute authority of God as creator, and the more they accept that they're a product of chance random processes as is taught through our public education system so widely, the more people are going to become logical in their thinking. If there's no one who sets the rules, why can't I do what I want to do? Now, I don't say that people necessarily go home and think, therefore, because I'm a product of evolution, now I'm going to go out and do this. But it becomes something that permeates society as an absolute basis is rejected and it's replaced by one that says everything is relative, everyone can have his own opinions, then I'd suggest to you the more people will reject the Christian ethics. The more we'd see a rejection of marriage and all the things that are associated with Christianity, the more you'd see an increase in abortion, homosexuality, pornography, lawlessness. Tell me, do you see those things? But how many of us have really connected the issues today the issues of abortion, lawlessness, homosexuality, etc., with this whole foundational area of creation evolution. You know, understanding this creation evolution area is a key to understanding what's really happening in our society. As a Christian, I realize that the only way I could ever come to the right conclusion about anything is on the basis of the one who knows everything. You see, if you think about it, we've got a problem. We don't know everything. And the only way you could ever be sure of coming to the right conclusion about anything is on the basis of one who knows everything. Anyone here in that category? It's interesting, isn't it? You realize no matter how much you know, there's an infinite amount more to know, which means no matter how much you know, you don't know how much more there is to know anyway. <laughs> Neither do you know how much you do know or don't know, which means, let's face it, you just don't know much at all. All right? In fact, no human being knows much at all. And that's a real problem. That's why theories change all the time, don't they? I was debating a particular scientist from America on radio and he said that scientific theories change. I said, that's right, don't they change because man finds knowledge he didn't know? That's true, he said. And I said, well, they'll keep on changing, won't they? That's true, he said. And I said, isn't that because we don't know everything there is to know about everything? That's right. And I said, we never will, will we? He said, that's true. I said, that means you can't be sure about evolution either, can you? Oh, he said, evolution's fact. Now, what we have to realize is no scientist knows everything. And therefore, we can never be sure we're going to come to the right conclusion about anything. However, I have a book called the Bible. And the Bible claims to be the word of God who knows everything. And therefore, I realize as a Christian, all of my thinking must be built on what it says. In other words, I can't just add my thinking to the Bible. The Bible has to be the basis for the whole of my thinking. And I must bring all of what I think in subjection to the one who owns me, who knows everything. You know, one of the sad aspects I see of this whole philosophy that everyone has a right to his own opinion, because that's what's permeating our society, that's what's coming through our public education system, is the way in which it's rubbed off on the church. When you're talking about issues like abortion, homosexuality, women's role in the church and so on, you often go along to churches and people have lots of different opinions. Let's sum up all these opinions. How many times do we hear people saying, hang on, God owns us, he sets the rules, his word is infallible, he's the one that knows everything, let's start with what he says and let's build our whole thinking in this area on that basis. You know, it's very sad that this whole philosophy of everyone has a right to their own opinion so permeates our society and even our churches. And we need to really understand the right way to think. You know, there was a group in Australia started up once called Toleration. They wanted to promote a tolerance of all religious ways, beliefs and doctrines. And they put out a promotional leaflet to promote this tolerance of all beliefs. You know, we've got to stop being intolerant of other people's beliefs. On the first page of their promotional leaflet, they listed all the things they were against. But they wanted a tolerance of all beliefs. You know, this whole idea of teaching a tolerance of all beliefs, which also permeates our education system, what's it saying? We've got to tolerate everyone's religious ways, beliefs and doctrines. So what happens when Christians come along and say, hang on, here's what's right and here's what's wrong. God sets the rules. Oh no, we can't tolerate that. We've got to tolerate all beliefs. Do you see what they've done? They've been intolerant of the absolutes of Christianity because the absolutes of Christianity are intolerant of their philosophy which says everything can be done in accord with one's own opinion. But let's just consider some specific examples because we really need to understand that all of our doctrines are dependent upon the book of Genesis. Let's take the whole message of the gospel and what Jesus did on the cross. What is the gospel message? Well, when you read 1 Corinthians 15, which is the definition passage of the gospel, 
It tells us about the fact of Jesus Christ being crucified, raised from the dead. But then Paul asks the question, but if people don't believe in the resurrection, what does he do? He goes right back to the book of Genesis. Why? Because if you go back to the book of Genesis, what do you find? God made Adam and Eve. They were perfect. They had a special position relation with God. God gave them a choice, so to speak. They rebelled against God. That rebellion's called sin. You know, here's a very important aspect for us to understand. Extremely important. As a result of man's actions came sin. As a result of sin came death. Romans 5.12 teaches that. 1 Corinthians 15 teaches that. Genesis 3.23 teaches that. And so it goes on. Physical death came only after man sinned. Think about it. The Bible tells us without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission of sin. God required the shedding of blood for the remission of sin. When God first made the animals, the Bible tells us they were vegetarian. We were created to be vegetarian. We weren't told we could eat meat until after Noah's flood. Before that time, we were vegetarian. We were created to be vegetarian originally because the whole world was perfect. There was no death. In fact, doesn't the Bible teach us one day there's going to be a restoration of all things? This world will be restored. It means put back to what it used to be. And what's the description of the restoration? The lion and the lamb and the wolf will be there and eat straw like an ox and a little child. No death, no suffering. That doesn't sound like today's world, does it? But it sounds like the description in Genesis. You know, why did God send death into the world? Many people are frightened of death. Many non-Christians say, oh, God can't be a God of love. Look at all the death in the world. You know, the very reason for death is because God is a God of love. Why do we say that? In fact, as Christians, we should praise God for death. When man rebelled against God, he would have been cut off from God for eternity. The final effect of sin would have been eternal separation from God. But God didn't want that. He wanted us to spend eternity with him. So he placed upon us the curse of death so he had to die. Then he came in the person of Jesus Christ, the perfect sinless son of God, who suffered the same curse of death on a cross. He was raised from the dead so those who trust in him as Lord and Saviour can spend eternity with him. Isn't that a tremendous message? The message of Christianity. Do you realise if death and bloodshed existed before man sinned, you've really destroyed the whole foundations of the gospel message. God brought in death and bloodshed as a means by which man could be delivered from sin and its final effect. And yet if you believe in evolution, as so many Christians do, look at today's world. Well, if it's an evolutionary world, it's gone on for millions of years. It'll go on for millions of years into the future. You're not looking at an evolutionary world. The Bible tells us you're looking at a cursed world. If you believe in evolution, what's sin done to the world? If death has always been here, then death is nothing special. And I believe that Christians who believe in evolution, and I'm not saying they're not Christians, but I believe they should seriously consider the fact that they're really undermining the whole basis of the message of the cross, and that's a very serious thing indeed. And the whole basis of the message of the restoration. What are we going to be restored to? Death and struggle over millions of years? You know, the whole concept of struggle and survival of the fittest and so on is totally opposite to the nature of God anyway. He defined his creation as good. To understand why Jesus died on a cross, we have to go back to the book of Genesis to see where sin came from, where death came from. The whole foundations of the gospel message are there in Genesis. Let's look at another example. Jesus was asked a question concerning divorce that concerned marriage. How did he answer them? They were trying to trick him. He said, haven't you read, he which made them at the beginning made them male and female and said, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife and they'll be one flesh. Where was he quoting from? The book of Genesis. Jesus quoted from Genesis. He quoted from Genesis on many occasions. He took it as literal truth, as historical. In fact, he built these doctrines like marriage upon the literal events of Genesis. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth and the life. He wasn't a liar. He wouldn't tell us something that wasn't true. Why did he quote from Genesis? Because the meaning of marriage goes back to the book of Genesis. God took dust and made Adam, took his side and made a woman. You become one when you're married. Why? Because you're one flesh historically. If it's not so historically, it's not so now. The issue of homosexuality, you know, it's such an easy one to solve for Christians. It really is. The issue of homosexuality, it's not a matter of one's opinion. It's a matter of God made marriage, God made man and woman. What does he say? And it really is easy. God made Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. He made a man and a woman. 
not a man and a man. He told them to be fruitful and multiply. In fact, we're told in Malachi 2.15, one of the primary importances of marriage is to produce godly offspring. Who will affect the world for Jesus Christ? Who will produce godly offspring? Who will affect the world for Jesus Christ? And so it goes on. You know, it's sad that in our churches there are so many marriage problems, so many family problems amongst our people in our churches. And I believe it's related to two major reasons. One, so many people don't understand what it means that God is creator, he sets the rules, we must submit ourselves totally to him, nothing is a matter of our opinion. And of course, in many of our schools, often girls are taught, oh, you know, if you do get married, remember, you're an individual, you've got your rights. You know what? When you get married, you're one with your husband and God has total right over your life anyway. And if you want your marriage to work or your family to work, what we've got to understand is that God made marriage, God made the family unit, therefore, what does he say are the rules? And what I'd say to you is this, ladies and gentlemen, are you prepared to accept the roles God gave for you regardless of your opinion? And to be honest, I'm not interested in your opinions anyway, because it's not really a matter of your opinion, is it? You understand what I'm saying? For instance, let's take women in marriage. I'll get to the men in a moment. But let's take the women. You know, I know the feminists are out there demanding equality. You know, it's not a matter of equality because men and women are equal. That's what the Bible teaches. It's a matter of roles. God made women, God made men. What are the roles he gave to us? Adam was created first, Eve was deceived, a woman will be in submission to her husband. End of argument, isn't it? A man will be the head of the woman. That's what the Bible teaches. It's not a matter of our opinion. It's a matter of, are we going to accept what God says? He's the creator. What about fathers? It says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. He gave himself for it. Do we love our wives sacrificially like that? Or it tells us in Isaiah 38, 19, the fathers to the children shall make known thy truth. Proverbs 1, 8, hear the instruction of your father. Forsake not the law of your mother. Genesis 18, 19, a father complimented for the way he trained his children. Who's to be head of the house? Spiritual head. Fathers. Who in the majority of Christian homes though has the prayer times and Bible readings with the children and brings them up spiritually, mum or dad? And the answer I get everywhere I preach is mum. And you know, that's not right. It doesn't mean mothers shouldn't get involved. But if fathers don't take on that spiritual headship, you often see the sons rebel against Christianity. You often see the daughters who date non-Christian fellas and marry non-Christian husbands and get in a mess. If you don't give them the right foundation, the structure's not going to stand. You know, we want that structure to be transmitted to the next generation, don't we? And if we don't give the foundation for the structure, don't expect the structure to stand. It's like a man who came to me and he said, you know, my sons rebel against Christianity. They said, why should we obey your rules? You know, he said, I never thought to tell them they weren't my rules. I hadn't ground them in the fact that God was creator and he set the rules. They just saw it as my opinions and so they decided to have their own. You know, when you think about what we're doing with the next generation, which is going to affect generations to come, think about the Australian Aborigines, for instance, or the American Indians. When they were first discovered, they were an anti-God people that worshipped evil spirits. In Australia, the Australian Aborigines were a Stone Age culture. And yet, you know, their ancestor, if the Bible's right, was Noah, going back to Adam. Their ancestors could make musical instruments, could build boats, knew about God. What happened to them? Well, somewhere in their ancestry, they've rejected God. And how long would it take to produce a so-called primitive race? How long? One generation. Take the hippies in Australia that go into the jungles, that have kids and don't teach them about the Bible or technology or medicine and you'll produce a primitive race in one generation. Or take a nation such as America, Australia, other nations in the world, take a nation that brings students through a public education system and doesn't teach them about the Bible or God and you'll produce a primitive culture in one generation. And I believe there's an awesome responsibility on our part because if we don't give them the right foundation, the structure's not going to stand that should stand. Let's take one other issue, the issue of clothing. I noticed today that it looks like in any way you're all wearing clothes. Well, that's great. Why are you wearing clothes? Well, during winter, you could say, because it's cold. During summer, you might say, I like to wear clothes when it's hot. You can have all sorts of opinions. But you know, in reality, the reason we wear clothes is because of a moral reason. God gave clothes because of sin. Where do we go to find that? The book of Genesis. What do we find there? When God made Adam and Eve, they were naked. They rebelled against God. As a result of that rebellion, sin came into the world. Sin distorts nakedness. Sin distorts everything. What did God do? He gave them coats, the first blood sacrifices, a covering for their sin. 
beautiful picture of something to come, wasn't it? He gave them coats. You know, in the New Testament, it singles men out. If a man lusts after a woman in his heart, the Bible teaches us he commits adultery in his heart. Why single men out? Well, if you're a man, you know, don't you, fellas? Because men respond to a woman's body sexually very, very, very easily, don't they? Yes, some are looking at me, some are staring, some are looking down. Yes. You know, I said that at a minister's conference once, and one young minister jumped up and said, Amen. <laughs> I uh, had to have a little talk to him later. But men were created that way, and it was to be in a response to one woman in a perfect relationship, their wife. But now sin distorts that, and fellows have a problem called lust. By the way, fathers, have you told your daughters what men are like? Because if you don't tell them, they won't know. And they need to be told that what they wear or don't wear can easily put a stumbling block in the man's way and cause him to commit adultery in his heart. And it's not a matter of the fashions of the day. And it's not a matter of fighting with them. You know at home how it goes? You're not going to wear that daughter. Why not? It's not right. Why isn't it right? You shouldn't wear that. Why not? Because it's wrong. Why is it wrong? Because Christians don't wear that. Why is it wrong? Because you don't wear that. Why not? Because you're not going to wear it. Why not? Ah, uh, Mum and Dad, you're old-fashioned. Ah, uh, Mum and Dad, that's your opinion. I got mine. You know, what you should say is you understand that God is creator. He sets the rules. You know that all of our doctrine goes back to the book of Genesis. You know the meaning of anything is tied up with its origin. You know that Peter teaches us we have to have reasons for what we believe. So it's not a matter of my opinion. It's a matter of let's go back to our absolute authority and see what he says about the origin of clothes, why he gave clothes, what men are like, etc., etc., etc. Now you're aware what I tell you to because I'm your parent anyway. And the reason you say that is because it says children obey your parents and the Lord for this is right. And that's not a matter of your opinion either. Because God tells us. And I hope we get the picture. We should construct a standard of clothing in accord with why clothing was given. You know, what I'm saying to you is this. If we take the creation foundation, we believe in God as creator, we understand the book of Genesis as literal historical truth, then we understand our doctrine. We know why we believe in right and wrong. We know why we believe in marriage. God sets the rules. He tells us what's good and what's bad. It's not a matter of our opinion. We have an absolute authority. We know why we wear clothes. We know why there has to be a standard of clothing. We know what life's all about. We understand all these things because we have that foundation for that structure to stand upon. On the other hand, if you remove the creation basis, if you believe that you're just a product of chance, if you believe more and more that science has proved the Bible wrong and, and evolution's true, who sets the rules? You do. So why not be lawless in that sense? Why not be a homosexual? Isn't that another opinion? Why shouldn't it be a valid opinion? Why not take your clothes off? Why not do what you want with sex? After all, there are no rules except what you make if you can get away with them. When it comes to issues like abortion, well, we're just animals anyway. What does it matter? And consider for a moment the issue of abortion. How many people realise that abortion and evolution really do go hand in hand? The more people were taught you're just an animal, you get rid of spare cats, get rid of spare kids. What's it matter? You're all animals anyway. You have a right to do what you want with your body. Nobody has a right to tell you what to do. You're a product of chance. There's no God. You know, there was a man called Ernest Haeckel who invented a theory many people will remember being taught. When an embryo develops in its mother's womb, it goes through a fish stage with gill slits. Remember being taught that? Till it becomes human? It was a fraudulent view. He made it up. It's been proven to be fraud. Yet it's still in many universities in our world today. It's still in many schools in our world today. Many abortion clinics use that to justify to the girls, you're just cutting up a fish or a jellyfish. How many people realise that abortion and evolution have gone hand in hand? The increasing popularity of abortion has gone hand in hand with the increasing popularity of evolution. We could look at other issues, such as racism. Do you realise racism and evolution have gone hand in hand? Look at it historically. People who believed in evolution said, because evolution's true, different races in the world have evolved to different levels, therefore there are some people who aren't as advanced as others. And when the white settlers first went, for instance, to Australia, to the state of Tasmania, they lined up across the state in various places and shot every Aboriginal they came to. Why? They're just primitives. They won't understand white man technology. They're products of evolution. In fact, in one of the museums down there in Tasmania, it basically tells people that's why, one of the reasons anyway, that they shot them out. Many of the racist ideas in regard to the Negroes were because of people's understanding of evolution and they said, oh, the adult Negro, he has the intelligence of only 11 or 12-year-old white person. And these ideas promoted racism. 
In fact, when we want to look at the root causes of our racist ideas, look at our education system that's teaching people their products of evolution. When it comes to even issues like communism, Nazism, go back and read about Hitler. He admits he believed in evolution and what he believed about evolution determined what he did with the Jews. He was just applying survival of the fittest, nature red in tooth and in claw. We're the superior race and we're going to eliminate the others. And many commentators since, such as Sir Arthur Keith and others, have said what Hitler did was only consistent with what he believed about Darwin and evolution. You can go back and look at that fact. You know, it's interesting, I know a university lecturer in Australia, and he used to lecture at Sydney University, and he said, you know, with the Chinese students, they tell me that when somebody becomes a Christian, the first thing they say is, ah, oh, so you've given up Darwin. They equate becoming a Christian with giving up Darwinian evolution. Because the whole communist ideology is justified necessarily in a view of origins that says there is no God. How many people realize that really what you believe about where you came from affects your whole worldview? And you know, we need to grasp that. What you believe about where you came from affects your view of life, your view of your fellow man. And the more people are taught they're just a product of chance random processes, the more they're taught that they have animal in their ancestry, the more we'll expect them to see them acting like that. The more they're a product of chance, why not do our own thing? Why not write our own rules? We can do whatever we want to do. On the other hand, we understand when it comes to these issues of homosexuality, drugs, abortion, infanticide, pornography, violence, divorce, promiscuity and so on, they're not the results of animal in your ancestry, they're the results of sin. And as the results of sin, they should not be coddled and justified on the basis of evolution, but they should be condemned and judged, if not first repented, forgiven and forsaken. Let's sum all this up and see what we're saying. If you remove a basis in the absolute authority, if you remove the absolute authority from our culture, if we remove the creation basis, you'd expect to see all the absolutes collapsing. And we do. We see the Christian ethics falling around us. Christians are saying the world's getting worse and worse, but what's happening? Why is this so? Well, the more you remove the creation basis and the more you replace it with an evolutionary philosophy that says there is no God, the more you'll see the increase in all of these issues we've been talking about. And people say to me, but are you therefore blaming evolution? Are you blaming evolution for what's happening in society? Well, the ultimate cause is rejection of God as creator. But let's be honest and let's face reality. What has become the scientific justification for rejecting God as creator? Evolution. It's an anti-God religion that pervades our public schools. You know, when they tell us we can't teach creation in school because that's religion, but we can teach science, and they say we can't allow religion in schools, what they're really saying is we can't allow Christianity in schools. We've replaced it with another religion. And it's a religion that is destroying our society. Let's think of two castles. One castle's called humanism. Its foundation is evolution. And all those issues, abortion, homosexuality, and so on. Another castle beside it, called Christianity, and its foundation is creation. You know, there's a real battle in our society. There are people in each castle with guns, guns that are aimed. And let me tell you where the battle is. The evolutionists know, aim your guns at the foundation, knock out creation, the structure collapses. What do the Christians do? Well, by and large, they shoot at each other. They have their cannons aimed at each other. You can go to churches and see that sometimes. Cannons aimed across the aisle, or uh, three or four aimed at the pulpit, or whatever it happens to be or they aim their cannons into nowhere, or they aim them at the issues. You know what I mean by aiming them at the issues? We want to fight the abortion issue. Well, it's wrong. Why? Because a fetus is human. Why is that? Because it's obvious. Well, why is abortion wrong? Because it's not right. Why isn't it right? Because it's wrong. How many people fight it at the issue level instead of saying, hang on, God's the creator, he sets the rules, let's see what his word says. The reason I'm against abortion is because God is creator. His word tells me, Psalm 139, Psalm 51, many other places, at the point of conception you're human, therefore abortion is killing. We are not the product of chance random processes, we are not just animals, God created us. What I'm saying is if we don't fight the issues at a foundational level, even if we get the laws changed today in regard to abortion or pornography, what happens when the next generation comes through who so believe evolution even more and reject creation and Christianity, won't they just change the laws back again? 
We have to fight it at a foundational level. There's a war on. There's a war in society. It's Christianity versus humanism. But you know, at a foundational level, it really is creation versus evolution. You know, the whole creation evolution issue is not just a side issue. It's one of the most fundamental important issues of today. And if Christians don't grasp what the foundational issues are, we're not going to be successful in the long run in evangelizing society. And you know, there's one other aspect to this. We want to be out there proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ because people say to us, well, that's the answer. We need to tell them about Jesus Christ. But you know what? 1 Corinthians 1 says the preaching of the cross is foolishness to the Gentiles but a stumbling block to the Jews. Foolishness to the Gentiles. What did Abraham say? If they don't hear what Moses and the prophets wrote, they're not going to be persuaded necessarily if one rose from the dead. You know, when you look in Acts, you find when Peter went to the Jews, his major message was, this Jesus Christ, whom you crucified. You know, the Jews already believed in creation. They had a creation basis, didn't they? But when Paul went to the Greeks in Acts 17, when he mentioned the resurrection, they said, what strange doctrine is this? So what did he do? This altar you have to the unknown God, him whom you ignorantly worship. Let me tell you who he is. He's the creator. He's the sustainer. He made of one blood all nations that dwell on the earth. You know what Paul did? He started from a creation basis. You know why? Because the Greeks believed in evolution. They didn't believe in creation. They believed the gods evolved, you evolved. You know, New Tribes Mission and many other mission organisations know that when you go to a pagan tribe, you don't start with Matthew, Mark, Luke or John, you start with Genesis to tell them who God is, where they came from, where sin came from, where death came from and so on, so then they'll understand the message of the cross. I'd like to make a suggestion to you. Years ago, our society was like the Jews. It had a creation basis. It was taught through the universities and schools. Evangelists could come in and preach the message of the cross and get a tremendous response. But there's been a change and the church has missed it. We no longer are like the Jews. We now have generations coming through who are like the Greeks. They don't have a creation foundation. And when you preach the message of the cross, that's foolishness unto them. And if we really want to be successful in reaching the pagans, we've got to start from the creation basis. Because evolution has become one of the biggest stumbling blocks to today's people being receptive to the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, it's like the sower and the seed. The seed can only grow when it falls in prepared ground. I'd like to suggest to you there's very little prepared ground left and we need to be out there knocking out the trees and the rocks and so on, pioneer evangelism to plough the ground so we can again plant the seed. If we're honest, most of our evangelistic thrust today really only reach those with some sort of church background or some understanding of Christianity or God. We are not reaching the pagans. And that's going to become increasingly so the more these generations come through our education system with no background knowledge of God or the Bible at all and they're going to be harder and harder to reach. Creation evangelism is one of the most important means of evangelism today. You know, people, we're crying unto you, saying, look, the issue is Christianity versus humanism. Yes, but at a foundational level, it's creation versus evolution. And for those many Christians who say it doesn't really matter, ignore the creation evolution, that's too controversial, they're ignoring the very foundational battle, the very foundational battle that is so prevalent in our society. We need to get involved in that foundational battle. We need to be out there attacking evolution as religion and restoring the foundations of creation so that that whole structure again can be built and stand. It's a real important issue. There's a war on. Are you involved in the battle or are you ignoring the foundational issues? Thank you. Well, now that you've seen this film, perhaps you're sitting there and thinking, Ken, I can see that this creation evolution issue really is important and I should do something about it, but I really need to know more. Well, this is where we can help you. In the next 60 seconds, what I'm going to do is to tell you a few simple ways you can get started. First of all, I recommend you obtain a copy of the book of this film. It'll reinforce what you've seen. The Genesis solution is illustrated and it does contain a lot of additional information to help you enthuse others about the importance of this foundational issue. Second, your children are being bombarded with evolution through the media. Here is a tremendous Christian tool for families, the great dinosaur mystery and the Bible. I believe every family and every library should have a copy. 
You can get these books from Christian film libraries or Christian bookstores. And now thirdly, and this is most important, now that you see how vital this issue is, you need to get informed on the evidences for creation. The same producers of this film have also produced an award-winning series of films called Origins, How the World Came to Be. Beautiful colour, fast moving, professionally done. Six 30 minute motion pictures. Origins gives you an ideal way to show people that creation is true. I've seen so many people who have turned away from evolution after seeing the exciting facts these inspiring films reveal. And I urge you, make use of them.